Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker of today, <laughs> David Bensley. Uh, David graduated from Harvard in 1999 under the supervision of Ed Franco. Uh, after spending four years at the University of Chicago, he joined the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he is the Joe and Lewis Cook Professor of Mathematics. David is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. Uh, he has won uh, many prestigious awards and grants, such as the NSF Career Award and the NSF Five Year Individual Grant. Uh, he was already in Oxford before. In 2007, uh, he gave the LMS Invited Lecture Series here. Um, David works uh, in the intersection of uh, representation theory, geometry, and physics. Uh, he has contributed immensely to our understanding of the deep connections between these areas. Uh, David is also a, a very kind and a very modest person. Uh, he told me, well, he emailed me that he is the third best mathematician from his primary school uh, here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, without further ado, the, let's give David <laughs> the chance to talk. And the title of his talk is Representation Theory as Gauge Theory. Thank you. Thank you, Colby, for this and words. Um, and I'd like to thank organizers for this tremendous opportunity to speak before you here. Um, so I want to, to introduce you to a new perspective on representation theory that I find very compelling and also drives my own research in the area. And um, so gauge theory is the, the physics behind the electromagnetism standard model and it's very familiar to mathematicians through its great successes in, in low-dimensional topology. What I'd like to tell you about today is, is uh, how to view representation theory through the lens of page theory and some of the applications, some of the new insights we gain from this perspective. So my, my own experience in, in representation theory started uh, when I was 19 in a cross-country trip in the US uh, sitting in the back of the station wagon and reading this uh, amazing survey article by George Mackey, uh, Harmonic Analysis is Exploitation of Symmetry. Um, so in this article, Mackey uh, presents the development of representation theory in response to a, a series of problems from number theory, physics, and other areas. These are problems where there's a tremendous amount of, of symmetry. And uh, we can exploit that symmetry in order to decompose the problem into smaller, more manageable problems. Uh, so I'd like to explore Mackey's theme through today's talk, and I'd also like to be guided by, by three other themes. So the, the, the second theme is uh, commutative algebra of signals geometry. This is a theme we associate with uh, Gelfand and Grotenbeek. And the idea is that whenever you see a commutative ring, you should think that there's a space behind it. That whenever we see, run into a commutative ring, we should try to find a geometric realization, the spectrum of the ring, and realize the ring as the commutative ring of functions on that space. Um, and so this gives us a way of translating problems in algebra, for example, understanding modules of a ring, into problems in geometry, for example, studying vector bundles or sheets on this space. Uh, our, our third theme will be that topology provides commutativity, by which I really mean just that homotopy groups in dimension bigger than one are commutative. So once you have, once you're not in one dimension, you have two points. They can move around each other continuously. Uh, and that's kind of a fundamental principle where we see commutativity, where we are going to have two operators and they're going to allow them to move around each other, and that's going to relate to A times B to B times A. <coughs> so, uh, and the fourth and final thing I'd like to to get to is is this is the goal that gauge theory is a bridge from topology to representation theory. We're going to think of gauge theory as a way of encoding the question structures of representation theory in the topology of low dimensional manifolds. So that's our that's our goal. Uh, let's get going. So our, our first topic is going to be kind of a crash course on representation theory. So representation theory for me, and a lot of like a lot of subjects, starts with with Fourier series. So what, what um, one idea of Fourier series? We, we're going to look at a group here. The group is the circle group U1, and the group is acting on the circle itself by rotation. So this means that we can take functions on the circle. So here we're taking L2 functions on the circle and decompose them into eigenspaces of all the rotation operators. We could try to take any function and pick out the ones that are, that are eigenspaces with respect to circle rotation. 
these are the Fourier modes. These are the exponentials in each of the two pi n theta. So uh, the theory of Fourier series says that we can write a basis for functions. We can write any function as an expansion in these basic eigenspaces, these basic modes. Here's an illustrative picture. Uh, so we're going to use Fourier series as kind of a guiding principle for what, uh, what we do in representation theory. So given a, a group G, uh, we're going to consider some kind of dual of G. So here we discuss the unitary dual. This is the set G hats, the set of irreducible unitary representations of G. So in the case of the circle group, those are all realized in functions on the circle. These are all the exponentials. These are all the possible joint characters, the joint eigenspaces of rotation. So to any group G, we'll assign a set G hat, and we'll try to understand the relation between G and G hat. One of the first aspects of this relation is that if uh, we have a representation of the group, we have a vector space of which the group is realized, then we can specially decompose it. We can break it up into kind of generalized eigenspaces. We can picture here a picture of a representation V as spread out over the set G hat. So for each um, for each uh, possible unitary representation, we've written the multiplicity space, how many times it appears. So here, this representation at one multiplicity, I don't know if this is at all visible, but maybe the handshaking will make it better. Um, and there is the, this one had multiplicity two at, at this character, and so on. So any representation is going to break up into a family of vector spaces labeled by g hat. So how are we going to access g hat? How do we get to, to understand something about g hat? Well, we're going to use the group algebra. So if I have a group acting on a representation, I get a lot more operators acting on the representation than just group elements. I can take linear combinations of elements in the group, or maybe smear or continuous linear combinations of elements in the group. And uh, these are called group algebra. I won't be very specific. Different classes of, of group algebra that appear in different settings of representation here. But for example, in the case of the circle, we can look at continuous functions on the circle. So here I've tried to write a couple of little bump functions on the circle. And they will act on all L2, L2 functions on the circle through the convolution product. So here, a bump head, one bump here, and a bump there, multiply together to a bump at the sum of the circles. So whenever we have a representation of G, we get an algebraic structure. We have a, a module for this algebra. Now, when the group is abelian, then this algebra of all operators generated by G is a, is a big, nice, commutative algebra. So, and again, depending on the setting, this might, you might just think of this as a discrete ring, you might think of this as a C-star algebra. <coughs> um, so our principle, our second, our second theme, was when you see a commutative algebra, you should think that there's geometry. So we have this uh, commutative algebra, this group algebra. We're going to find a space. This is, again, going to be the unitary dual, but now not just as a set. It's going to be a topological space, uh, or geometric object, which is its spectrum. And this can make, help us make much more, more precise the idea of taking representations of the group G and spectrally decomposing them. So modules over this algebra, depending on your setting, will give either sheaves or vector bundles or projection valued measures in the setting of the classical spectral theorem on the dual. So this is the, the sense of spectral decomposition. So we put this all together and we get a, an extremely successful example of representation theory, which is the, the Fourier transform. So the kind of general theme of the Fourier transform, I want to think of it that I have a group G and I have this set G hat, or this space G hat. And I'm going to take a representation theory of G and translate it into geometry of G hat. That's sort of the, the Fourier transform in a nutshell. So for example, we have a group, uh, I should be pointing. Oh, I can't even see it. Uh, so we have the, the circle group U1. It's uh, dual G hat was, was just the integers. Notice that we had a compact group that's dual, it's just a discrete set. Uh, if you take a, a non-compact group, such as the real line, then the unitary dual is isomorphic to the real line again. The points of the dual, this is how we define the dual, the points of the dual correspond to the irreducible representations of G. So on one hand, you have points. On the other hand, you have the irreducible representations, which here are just these one-dimensional, these exponentials, the characters, e to the 2 pi i x t where t is going to be the integral or real, depending if you're in the circle or the real group. Now, these characters, these are just representations, actually form a basis for functions on G. And this gives us the Fourier transform. We can write any function on G in this basis of characters. The coefficients become a function on G hat. And this gives us a unitary isomorphism between L2 of G and L2 of G hat, which is the Fourier transform. What does the Fourier transform do? Its whole point is that we've taken anything that comes out of the group and translated it into something much more geometric. 
So, for example, the translation action of the group itself, or the differentiation of the Lie algebra, or the more general differential operators, the enveloping algebra, or the convolution action, the group algebra. All of these operators that you construct out of the group, they all become multiplication operators on the other side. They've all been simultaneously diagonalized. That, that's the, the Fourier transform. Diagonalizes anything coming out of the group into simple multiplication operators on the other side. Uh, and finally, given any representation of the group, we're going to spread it out as a family of vector spaces, again, maybe a sheaf or a vector bundle projection value measure, depending on your exact setting, as a family of vector spaces over the dual. So this is an extremely <coughs> successful kind of complete solution in some sense to representation theory of locally compact abelian groups. And this is going to kind of be the model for how you want to understand representations of non-compact groups or non-abelian groups. Uh, non groups. So let's think of an example. So a um, great example of a uh, action of a, of a non abelian group is just the group SO3, the group of rigid rotations of three-dimensional space acting on the two-sphere. So we look at the two-sphere and there's an action by isometries of SO3. And this lets us decompose. We look at functions on the sphere. We can decompose them into irreducible representations of rotations. We can take any function of the sphere and write it in a basis of elements that live in a kind of irreducible representation with respect to rotations. So the, the, um, what you see is, in fact, you see all of the irreducible representations of SO3. They're labeled by uh, an integer L, so they're all of odd, de various, all the odd de dimensions. And uh, here's an actual picture of these representations. These are actual functions on the sphere that live. Here's a function in the one-dimensional representation. These are functions in the three-dimensional representation, five-dimensional representation, and so on. You can really see the decomposition of the, of the all functions here into these irreducible representations. This is the theory of spherical harmonics. So how do we how do we think of this example in a way that we might be able to, to generalize? Well, when the group of rotations is acting on the sphere, it uh, because it's acting by isometries, it commutes with an operator, the Laplace operator on the sphere. So what you can do is just study the Laplacian on the sphere and decompose function on the sphere into eigenspaces of the Laplacian. And Wonderfully, this exactly gives us the decomposition we had before. The decomposition into irreducible representation works out to be exactly the decomposition into eigenspaces of the Laplace operator. So that's great. That feels a little extrinsic. I needed to know something about the geometry of the sphere. But it's actually something intrinsic. This Laplacian operator is coming from an operator that I can act on any representation of SO3. There's this operator, this quadratic Casimir. It's a quadratic expression here. I could write it as. Um, half of the sum of the squares of i, j, k, the little infinitesimal rotations around the three axes. So this is a <coughs> quadratic expression I can write in the Lie algebra of SO3, which will act on any representation. And when you act on the operators of the three sphere, this gives, on the two sphere, this gives you the Laplacian. So that means that whenever I have a representation of SO3, I can try to diagonalize the Casimir operator. And this gives me my, my spectral decomposition. So here we can see the dual of SO3, the set, the set of unit representation, is the set of positive integers. And this Casimir acts by a scalar, L, L plus 1, on each of these irreducible representations. In other words, the Casimir gives a function on G hat. To each irreducible representation, we have a number. OK. So let's try to take this example seriously. Our, our theme was we, when we see, to see geometry, we should look for commutative algebra. That's our reverse of our second theme. So in order to, to access the dual for non for non-dealing group, we're going to look for a commutative algebra to act. So what's a natural source of a commutative algebra? Well, we have this big algebra of all operators. It's not commutative anymore. But look at the center. Look at the operators that commute with all elements in the group algebra. That's the center of the group algebra. Now, if you think what it means to commute with all the group, in particular, it means that your, your smeared combinations of group elements have to be invariant under conjugation. So what you have to get are functions that are constant on each conjugacy class. So really, functions of the set of conjugacy class, these are class functions. So that's our center of the group algebra, our class functions on the group. And by a short lemma, if you have a, an operator that commutes with the whole action of the group, on each of these irreducible pieces, it acts just by a number. It acts just by a, a scalar. So it gives us a function on the dual. For any irreducible representation, you just get a scalar for every central element. So we've produced a bunch of functions on the dual. Well, we can also take that logic backward. If we want to understand what the dual is, Let's think what a function on the dual would do. If I take a function on the unitary dual, so here I try to picture my same little unitary dualness again. 
And I tried to write a function which has values 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6. So this is a picture of a function on the dual. Now, this function on the dual will act by symmetries of any representation of G. Any representation of G fits in this kind of family of vector spaces. And so you get an operator just acting by that scalar. And so that tells us that, that uh, functions on the dual, again, are a kind of center. They act by symmetries of arbitrary representations of G. They actually commute with all maps of representations also. And this is called the Bernstein center in, in representation, the Bernstein center of the category of representations of G. So functions on the dual are this center. Um, so we can understand how to access the dual, we need to calculate and think about the center. Okay. So this is kind of our general uh, theme of how we're going to access, access the dual, how to access the structure of representations of G. So I wanted to talk about one of the most spectacular uh, examples of this theme of exploitation of symmetry, monic analysis of exploitation of symmetry, which is the Langmans program. Um, it's Langmans program in two slides. Um, so what, what's, the, what's the general problem? We're going to do it. It's going to, we're going to try to solve a spectral decomposition problem like we did on the two sphere, but now on the upper half space modulo SLTC. So we look at the moduli space of elliptic curves. Here's our familiar picture. Um, and so this is a moduli space of elliptic curves. We can write it as upper half space mod SL2C, or you can write, spell it out. Upper half space itself is the group SL2R modulo its maximal compact SL2, and then I modify SL2C. So I'm going to take this space, which clearly has something to do with group theory. And we're going to try to do harmonic analysis on this. Um, more generally, you can look at a class of, these classic arithmetic locally symmetric spaces. The details won't be crucial for us. But these are things that have a similar form. You have a real reductive group, you have a compact subgroup, and you have an arithmetic, arithmetic group gamma, arithmetic subgroup <coughs> gamma, which are labeled by some arithmetic data. So we have this labeled by data, a number field, a level structure at some points. Um, OK, so this is the kind of general setup for the Langmans program. Now, I said we want to do harmonic analysis. So we need to figure out what's acting. What are we decomposing with respect to? Uh, well, there's some obvious things. There's the Laplace operator. That's there, the group. That's, the, that's an operator we always have, and we can decompose with respect to it. There's actually a family, Harry Schunder, of, of higher Casimir operators, kind of higher versions of the Laplace operator, coming from the center of the enveloping algebra. So there's a natural family of geometric commuting operators. So there's something kind of more mysterious. For every prime number p, there's another algebra you can write down, which is the algebra of Hecke operators that also act. Uh, and so I won't give the definition of a Hecke operator, but you can think of it as kind of a, a graph or discrete Laplace operator. They're analogs of <coughs> graphic Laplacians. For example, I could take a function on the space of elliptic curves, and I can average it over I can replace the value of a fixed elliptic curve by the value where I average over other elliptic curves that differ from it only at the prime p. So look at only elliptic curves that differ from it by, by p isogeny, and I will take some weighted average. So this is this picture is supposed to roughly illustrate that. We can take a, a function, replace the value at this point by the kind of the sum over a fixed radius so this kind of static picture of a, of a heck operator. OK, so we have this very rich collection of operators acting on the space. So, what are we supposed to do? Well, there's a miraculous thing that all these Hecke operators at almost all primes, all the fundamental primes, they all commute. So we have this space, and kind of miraculous will produce a gigantic family of commuting operators. So now we know what to do. If you have a big family of commuting operators, well, what should you do? You should do the Langmans program. You should first study the spectral decomposition of all these operators. You should identify the spectrum, identify what this kind of joint spectrum is, and this is what the Langlands program tells us, that this joint spectrum is related to some space of representations of the Galois group. Um, and finally, you should use this to access the mysteries of the universe, which should be uh, evident here in the Andrew Wells building. One of the tremendous successes of this, of course, is the proof of Fermat's out there, this kind of point of view. OK, so that's, that's about all I can tell you about the Langlands program in a couple of minutes. Um, so let's go to somewhere else. Uh, so our second theme will be quantum field theory. So now let's give a crash course on what is quantum field theory. So I want to go back to this uh, picture that we saw. Now if you're like me, this, you see this picture, it kind of brings back some vague memories of high school chemistry. Um, and in high school chemistry, we talked about these atomic orbitals 
And we gave them names. We gave them names. There were S orbitals. There were P orbitals. There were D orbitals. There were F orbitals. And they, you had some funny pictures of their shapes. And, this, and the shapes were exactly the shapes that are apparent here. But this is not a, not a coincidence. The, one of the great successes of group representation theory is, is in quantum physics. So what's the kind of setup in, in quantum mechanics? We're going to take um, the Hilbert space of a, of a, of a quantum particle on a, on a manifold x. That's L2 of x. Look at L2 of x. And here x is going to be, in our example, was the two-sphere. We're thinking of a, a particle moving on the two-sphere. Um, and then we have the free particle Hamiltonian, which is just the Laplace operator. So it's exactly the data that we had before. We had the L2 functions and the Laplace operator on them. And well, if you have a group acting on x by isometries, it'll <laughs> act as symmetries of this quantum system. It'll act as unitary operators on the Hilbert space that will commute to the Laplacian. And great, so now we go back again to, our, to Mackey's theme. We should exploit this symmetry. We can take this uh, quantum system and decompose it into much simpler pieces. And this is what gives us the you know, relation from spe spectrum to you know, the actual rainbow notion of spectrum. We can actually use this to understand the spectra of atoms, to understand the structure of, of atomic orbitals. And this, this is such a successful example of exploitation symmetry. It led to this phrase of the group impasse, this plague of groups. Uh, physicists were very frustrated at Weil, Wigner, von Neumann, and so on, introducing all this group theory into nice physics. Um, it, it sort of overcome this since uh, it's such a successful tool, it's now become a standard part of what quantum mechanics is about. Great, so what is quantum mechanics about? Let's kind of try to give um, a sort of a summary. So there's the, the Schrodinger picture of quantum mechanics. We have a, a Hilbert state, that was our L2. That's a Hilbert space of states of the quantum mechanical system. And so that's our H. And we have a time evolution operator on this. So we have our uh, Hamiltonian operator H. This is our self adjoint operator. And we exponentiate it to a, to a group of unitary, unitary operators, which I call ut here. That's our, our time evolution operator. So as the picture, this is an interval of length t, of time, length t, time is involved. And I have an operator from H to H acting on states. And this is, when you write this down in terms of wave functions, this is the, the short end gives the short curve. This is the time evolution in quantum mechanics. So this is one picture. The other side is the, the Heisenberg picture. Um, <laughs> so if we um, also have in quantum mechanics, we have observables. And so what are observables? These are, again, self-adjoint operators on the Hilbert space. And, how, and very roughly, the measuring of, of making observations in quantum mechanics, the measurements correspond to these operators, is the spectral theory of these operators. We're going to take these operators and diagonalize them, or write our particular state in terms of eigenstates, and that's going to be how these operators observe. Great. So that's our algebra. We have this algebra of operators, and as everyone knows, the kind of one of the themes that we hear about quantum mechanics is Heisenberg uncertainty. So what is Heisenberg uncertainty? Operators on the Hilbert space don't commute. So we don't have our nice setting of a big commutative algebra of operators. We have a big non-commutative algebra of operators. In particular, the position operator which is multiplication by x and differentiation, which is the momentum operator, don't commute, which means you can't spectrally decompose with respect to both of us. And this, when you write this down, this becomes the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can't explain position and momentum precisely at the same time. So that's kind of a, a big, one of the big themes of quantum mechanics, this is not commutativity. <laughs> OK, so now that we've uh, mastered quantum mechanics, uh, so here's kind of a good caricature of quantum field theory, the way I've learned from ideas of Graham Siegel, and so Latia, Witten, and others. Um, so rough sketch of quantum field theory, and I'll start with a kind of Schrodinger picture. Um, we'll think of what states are. So what are states? Um, in quantum field theory, in n dimensions, we now have a whole bunch of different kinds of states. For every n minus 1 manifold m, n minus 1 dimensional Riemannian manifold m, we're going to attach a vector space I'll call it z of m. This is a space of states on m. So before, there was only one n minus 1 manifold was a point. Now we've gone to higher dimensions. We have a lot of different inputs, a lot of n minus 1 dimensional Riemannian manifolds. <coughs> uh, and and the, one of the rules of quantum mechanics is we have a disjoint union of manifolds m, it'll go to a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces. So that's our, our setup. This is our space of states. We also have time evolution. And time evolution also gets a lot more interesting. Time evolution becomes a geometric process. So now, whenever I have a Riemannian manifold, here I have drawn a Riemannian manifold M, which is a cobordism. Now it's an N manifold. 
that's a cobordism from some incoming manifold here, happened to be a disjoint union of two pieces, to another Riemannian uh, n minus 1 manifold. This is going to be my, my substitute for before I just had a little time interval. That was my cobordism from a point to a point. So now we have a lot of kind of interesting geometric time evolutions that such, a, such an operator will give me, uh, such a cobordism is supposed to give me an operator from the incoming Hilbert space to the outgoing Hilbert space. So that's the, the structure of time evolution. And we also need to be able to compose, let time evolve. We need to be able to compose. So if we, the composition is now given geometrically. If I glue cobordisms together, the operators are supposed to compose. Okay. So here is, I wrote an example. We have an operator going from states on M1 union M2 to states on M3 to states on M4 union M5. And that's supposed to be given by the composite. I glue these two cobordisms along this kind of colored manifold in the middle. So that's the, the very rough sketch of what states in quantum field theory do. Now, this is a beautiful picture, but it's extremely complicated. We've attached a, a space Z of M to every Riemannian N minus 1 manifold. So that's a kind of a huge amount of complicated data. What we're going to do is going to make kind of a radical simplification. We're going to say we want the space to depend only on the topology. So that we want to attach a vector space Z not to a Riemannian N minus 1 manifold, but just a topological manifold. And we want the time evolution also not to depend on the details of the metric, but just on the topology of M. So that's a wonderful wish. How do you make it happen? It doesn't usually drop in your lap this way. But there's a mechanism to make field theory topological. <coughs> and that mechanism is, is called supersymmetry, and closest mathematical formation, Hodge theory. We're going to uh, make the, the quantum field theory start with, we're going to try to make it topological. Uh, so just in a kind of a rough Rough idea. For example, in, in quantum mechanics, we started by studying functions, L2 functions on a manifold X. We're used to taking functions and replacing them by differential forms. It's not a, not a huge leap to make. But once we pass the differential form, we have this new operator, D. And what's the great thing about D is that you can write the Laplace operator now as D, D star plus D star D. What does this mean? This means that you have a homotopy from the Laplace operator to zero. That's what this formula is telling you. So that means that the, that the Laplace operator, which is our Hamiltonian, has become zero on the level of homology. So we've kind of actively killed time evolution. So what's left of logical quantum mechanics is not a whole lot. We've killed time evolution. All we have now is the vector space of states, this cohomology of this operator, D. Um, so that's, that's all there is. So topological quantum mechanics really boils down to just the vector space. So um, great, so what we'd like to do is do a similar simplification. We didn't need this to understand quantum mechanics, but we are going to need this to understand something about quantum field theory. So the question is, what's the analog of this statement for, for topological field theories, higher dimensions? So this is what I'd like to, to try to explain. So in order to explain that, we need to have this notion of extended locality, and extended field theory. So what is the notion? The idea is that, again, even if you assume everything's topological, you're still dealing with a huge amount of data. <laughs> You have to attach a vector space of states. OK, now it's only a topological n minus 1 manifold. There's still a whole lot of those. So what we'd like to do is understand some kind of more local picture. That's how we think of manifolds as patching together disks. We'd like to understand a more local version of state. We'd like to have a notion of state that lives not in a whole compact manifold, but just on a little piece of it. And the name for these are, are local boundary conditions. So what is a local boundary condition? I won't say it very precisely. I want to think of this as, as an n minus 1 dimensional Field theory. It's a field theory that lives just on the boundary. It's a local expression that lives on the boundary. But what it spits out for you are states. It's a mechanism that produces states for my original theory when I put it on a compact manifold. So it's a local beast that kind of integrates to give a state. So here's a, oops, this was supposed to be a picture here of a, a boundary condition B. And when I wrap that boundary condition on a compact manifold, it gives a particular element zero of this space of states on that compact manifold. Okay, so it's a, a local state. That's a slightly confusing notion, so let's draw a picture. So let's in an uh, example of a quantum field theory. Well, the example we had of quantum mechanics was a quantum particle. A, we thought it was a quantum particle moving on some manifold, so you can think of it as maps from a line, a timeline, into a manifold. There's a higher dimensional generalization of this called the sigma model, where instead of a line mapping to a manifold, we think of some higher dimensional space times, our ends and ends that we've been drawing, we think of it as mapping into a particle. OK, so if, you have, if you're studying a theory of maps into targets, so here I've tried to draw a map. Here's my n manifold n and its boundary m. If you think of maps into a target, there's a natural notion of what 
boundary conditions would be. So for example, if I have a, a space y mapping to x, here I've drawn y as actually as a submanifold. If I have a space y mapping to x, I can ask for maps to on the boundary of the manifold to land in y. And this is a local condition. I don't need to have a compact uh, n minus 1 manifold to ask for it to map into y. This makes sense. I'm just local pieces and, and glues together. So you can think of a boundary condition in, in the sigma model as being a submanifold, or generally a, a space y mapping to x. Or if you just want to work linearly, you can think of it as a family of vector spaces. Think of the family of cohomologies of the fibers of y. Think of a family of vector spaces uh, over x, uh, a vector level over x, for example. And we, I won't say this very precisely, but such boundary conditions, it's a, what is the way of producing states? Here in, in this theory, I'm thinking of the two-dimensional theory. The states are roughly the cohomology of this target. And we know how to produce cohomology classes of the target from either submanifolds or vector models. Either we take the fundamental class or we take the trim class. So this notion of a submanifold or vector model, these are local expressions that give us global things. They're characteristic classes. OK, so this is just to illustrate the idea of a boundary condition. But what I'm more interested in is what kind of things are boundary conditions. So states form a vector space. How do you organize boundary conditions into some kind of algebraic structure? And well, here's a, a picture of a boundary condition. Here's my boundary condition B. And what can I do with it? Well, one thing I can do with it is I can talk about interfaces. I can have two nearby boundary conditions, and I can have an interface. So here I have a green and a blue boundary condition, and I have a yellow interface between them. This is something that happened in now in core dimension two, where two boundary conditions meet. So for example, if you're thinking about maps into a target, I have two submanifolds of the target, I can ask where do they intersect. So I can ask in co-dimension two to, to go into this intersection of my submanifolds. So that's the one thing that boundary conditions can do. They have interfaces, which I'm going to think of as morphisms. There's maps between boundary conditions. But I can also have interfaces between the interfaces. So here, if I have enough dimensions, I can here I draw a little dot between a yellow interface and a purple interface. So I can, if I can go in higher co-dimensions, I can have things, interactions between the interactions the interactions. Um, so there's a mathematical structure we're getting here. We have a bunch of objects, our boundary conditions. We have morphisms. And then we have morphisms between the morphisms, and maybe morphisms between the morphisms between the morphisms, that are given just geometrically in terms of these decompositions. So the mathematical structure that captures this is the notion of a higher category. Here it's an n minus 1 category. So that's the algebraic structure that we see when we look at the space of states. So that's what states form. Instead of a vector space, they form some higher category. So now we, have a, we can ask the question, how do you describe a topological field theory from its states? Well, topological quantum mechanics, again, was just determined by a vector space, the vector space of states. A topological field theory is likewise going to be determined by its collection of states, or a local version of states, which have these boundary conditions. And this is uh, captured in this beautiful theorem of Jacob Lurie, the cohortism hypothesis. So the cohortism hypothesis says that if we look at an n-dimensional topological field theory, in this extended sense, it's completely determined by this category of boundary conditions. Again, this algebraic structure, the collection of boundary conditions, that's my version of the vector space of states, I can completely uniquely reconstruct the rest of the field theory from this structure. So field theories are determined by their states. So how do we think about this? You can think of the cohortism hypothesis as a, you know, a tool that you can build. I, I give you your favorite category, your favorite suitably finite higher category, so there's some assumptions I need to make to, to run that algorithm. And then we run the algorithm, we get a topological field theory. Um, so for example, in two dimensions, we don't need to think about all this higher category stuff. In two dimensions, if I give you a category, I'm going to output a two-dimensional topological field theory, which has this category as its boundary conditions. That's what the cohortism hypothesis says. So here's kind of a try to attempt to illustrate that. Here I have a picture um, of I have a, what do we have in a category. You have objects A, B, and C. For every object A and B, I have a home space that I think of as, as a, my interface between A and B. And I know that if I have home from A to B and a home from B to C, I can compose it and get a home from A to C. That's given by this cohortism picture. So what you get out of this cohortism hypothesis is an extremely powerful way of thinking about categories geometrically. It's a, a kind of a dictionary between the study of higher category theory and the just geometry of or topology of dimensions. OK, so this is how we were going to want to try to think about categories. Great, so now we've um, understood something about the um, picture of quantum field theory in terms of states. So let's go back to the Heisenberg picture. Um, so 
we need to also have in quantum field theory, we need to have a version of operators. We need to be able to make measurements. We need to have observables. So what are going to be local operators in quantum field theory? So these are measurements I can make at, at points of space time. So here I've drawn a little manifold M. I've allowed some time to evolve, and writing something like M cross R. And here I have a two points where I've inserted operators, O1 at point X and O2 at point Y. This is a two-dimensional picture. I've drawn it also in three dimensions, two and three-dimensional topological field theory. So operators are things I should be able to be able to put at these points. Now at this point, you're probably complaining. I've already thrown a lot of structure at you. We don't really want to have to introduce some more structure. Uh, but luckily, in topological field theory, this structure is already encoded in what we've said before. Namely, I, so something has happened to the picture. I've taken these points, and I've cut out little disks around them. So I take the points, and I cut out little balls around these points. And now what do I have? This picture is now, uh, now it now fits in the formulas we had before. Now we have a cobordism. We start from M, M here union a couple of two spheres, and a cobordism that goes to M. So the same picture can now be encoded in the same language of cobordism, so manifold. Um, so we don't need new structure. The local operators in the topological field theory are just given by states on a tiny, tiny sphere. Well, we're doing topological field theory. That was the whole point. We don't need to say the words tiny, tiny. It's a states on the sphere. Okay. So that's one of our advantages of working topologically. So we have a notion of operators. It's states on a tiny sphere. Mm -hmm. And these really give you operators. This cobordism picture tells you that they act on states or they act on boundary conditions. I didn't actually draw M to be compact. They act on just local versions of states. So we get operators. Now, great. So what about the algebra of operators? If I have operators, I should be able to compose them. So let's think about how to compose operators. I've drawn here three different pictures for the same thing. So I'm going to try to compose two operators in two dimensions. So I'm trying to write the composition map here from z of the circle, in my case, the tensor z of the circle to z of the circle. That's a multiplication map on operators. So the physics picture for this is the, called the operator product expansion. I think of an operator at point x and an operator at point y. I let the two points kind of collide and see what comes out, see what kind of new operators I can describe. Um, more topological picture of this is called little disks picture. I, again, I cut out little, disk, little disks around each of my points. And now I think of having an operator O1 sitting here, an operator O2. And if I look from far away, I get just one big circle. So the two operators O1 and O2 have kind of merged to make a new operator, which is their multiplication O1 star O2. A picture that might be most familiar in topological field theory is the picture of a pair of pants. It's the same picture kind of drawn sideways. I'm thinking of the same picture now as a cobordism, starting from two circles, O1, where I put O1 and O2. So I have two of them as states on this one manifold. And I have an operator, the pair of pants. The output is a new, it's a new state, which is the multiplication of O1 star O2. Okay. So these are three different ways to, to think what does it mean to compose operators. The main point, though, is that once we're more in above one dimension, we have enough room for these points to move around each other. So we're doing a topological field theory. Everything depends in a locally constant way on the position of the point. So I can take my two operators, O1 and O2, and continuously move them to it becomes O2 times O1. So this tells me that local operators in the setting of topological field theory commute once I'm in above one dimension. So this is, this is what, um, what we mean by this, by our second, our third theme, that topology produces commutativity. So let's, let's, why is this topology? Let's remind you of some pictures that we've probably seen in algebraic topology classes. In algebraic topology classes, we learn why pi 2 of a space is commutative. And we draw some, this is copied from a textbook, we draw some picture, version of these pictures to show that pi 2 of a space is commutative. So what is, why is pi 2 of a space commutative? We're looking at, um, think of drawing faced maps to some pointed target. So I draw, I have two maps here, an orange map and a green map. And I think that at the boundary, I'm going to the base point. <laughs> And so to compose base map, I put them next to each other, and, and that's my composition. But since I have this base point, I can kind of shrink the orange and the, and the green maps and think of just little blobs here. I have a little blob, a little green, orange blob, a little green blob, and on the complement, I'm just sitting at the base point. That's another picture of the same, same map up to home copy. But once you picture it this way, we can move the two blobs around each other continuously and then expand them back out. And we've gone from one multiplication to the opposite one. So this is the familiar proof that, that um, high two or higher homotopy groups are commutative because there's enough room to move around once you're above one dimension. So this is exactly what happened in topological field theory. 
in dimension one, when we were studying quantum mechanics, operators were an algebra of matrices, of algebra of operators, a non commutative algebra. This is kind of the characteristic feature of quantum mechanics. Once you go in dimension above one, in the topological world, operators are now commutative algebra. So that, that kind of hallmark has gone away. Operators can now form a commutative algebra. And that algebra, again, <laughs> this is our third theme, that commutativity has come from topology, from the fact that we have room to move around. So, great, so we have a commutative algebra of operators, but we know again what we're supposed to do. Someone gives you a commutative algebra, you should look for a space. That's our, that was our second thing. We have a commutative algebra of operators, that means that there's a space hiding around where this algebra realizes this function. Um, in the case of in the physics, this space has a name. This is called the moduli space of vacuo of the quantum field theory. So I start with the quantum field theory here. I just have a topological field theory. And I'm going to construct a space out of it where, the, which by definition, the functions are going to be local operators. So we get a kind of version of our chart of our Fourier transform in the setting of physics. We now have just a quantum field theory. There's kind of a version of a Fourier transform. We start with a topological field theory. We can translate it into geometry. We've actually built a space. What does that mean physically? Instead of thinking of an abstract field theory, we're going to build a sigma model, a theory that maps into a target. We've constructed some geometry. So physics, this is the low energy effective theory. This is an approximation to the physical theory as a theory of maps into a target. That's what the, this target is doing. The local operators have become functions on the space. This is, these are called VEPs, vacuum expectation values in the physics literature. We've made local operators into functions somewhere. The operator product expansion, the multiplication rule, by definition, is just pointwise multiplication <laughs> of functions on the modular space. Boundary conditions, or states, these are the things on which operators were acting, <coughs> now specially decomposed. They become families over MZ, <coughs> sheaves of some kind, families of vector spaces or families of theories, over this modular space. Um, and again, if you're working in the setting we were working you know, two just two-dimensional topological field, this modular space is tend to be discrete. So this is our, our kind of point of view of, on, on, uh, on topological field theory. It leads to a natural structure, which is exactly the structure we saw in representation theory, the structure of the Fourier transform. So what I'd like to do now is to take these two pictures. We've, we've run into the exact same structure in general setting of quantum field theory and in the setting of representation theory. I'd like to see how do they talk to each other. All right, so now we'd like to bring those together using using gauge theory. So, what is gauge theory? Um, so gauge theory is, uh, we start with a compact Lie group, and we study, we're going to study some theory of, uh, quantum theory of G bundles with connections thought of up to gauge transformations on a manifold, which is our space time. So this is a very well-known theme here in Oxford and in general in math. Um, it's in in low-dimensional topology, this is an extremely, extremely influential. Given a manifold M, we're going to get interesting topological invariants by counting, in some way, solutions, so counting, measuring some spaces of G bundles with connections on M. So this is how we usually think of, of gauge theory in math. Uh, I'd like to take a, a different point of view inspired by this Kaborism hypothesis. So to, in order to understand gauge theory, I want to think of what its boundary conditions are. So instead of taking a compact N manifold, I'm going to take a little, little uh, ball, take a little small piece of manifold. But locally, the point about connections, locally they're trivial. So locally, you don't have an interesting space of connections. They're all trivial, but they carry symmetry. They carry a pointwise action of this group G. That's our, that's our gauge symmetry. So that means that when we think of boundary conditions in a field theory, which is a gauge theory, what they're going to be are, they're going to be quantum field theories in, in the, this dimension, lower, lower <laughs> dimension, which carry an action of G. The boundary conditions in field theory are some kind of representations of G on quantum field theories. So it's quantum field theories with G symmetry. That's very stupid ways. But our point of view is that in the, in the topological setting, the Kaborism hypothesis tells us this actually determines the whole theory. If we input this idea, this tells us what the whole top quantum field theory is. So I, I think of this as the kind of revenge of the group in test that. In quantum mechanics, we utilize representation theory. But in quantum field theory, we can actually encode an entire representation theory. We can input representation theory as a matter of conditions and encode an entire structure within, within a particular quantum field theory. So this is our fourth theme. We're going to think of gauge theory as a way to bridge topology and representation theory. Okay. So that's the idea. Let's, let's see it in, in, in action. 
So the first place that you might want to see it is in two dimensions. We look at two dimensional and Mills theory, topologically Mills theory. We're going to count G bundles with connections on a, on a Riemann surface. If you might as well imagine G to be finite, then the count is literally, it's going to be a literal count. We're going to start counting this, this set. We have to interpret count correctly if, if G is not finite. But again, I want to emphasize the point of view of boundary conditions. So what are boundary conditions? Now we're in two dimensions, so our boundary is one dimensional. So a boundary condition is a one-dimensional field theory, in other words, a quantum mechanics theory. So our boundary conditions are quantum mechanics theories with G symmetry. For example, a particle in a G space. This is exactly the setting we were before. You think of a particle in the two-sphere with this SO3 action. That's a quantum system that has SO3 symmetry. That's exactly the kind of thing that gives a boundary condition for SO3 and Mills theory. So that's what the boundary conditions are. But in the topological setting, we can use this as a definition. I can define 2D and Mills theory by saying the boundary conditions, I'm going to input a category. What's my category? Take the category representation of your group G. I declare the category representation of G to be a category of boundary conditions, and I, there you go, I have a field theory. Okay. So that field theory captures representations of, say, my compact group G or my finite group G. Um, so let's, what can you see in this point of view? Well, let's look at the local operators. Uh, we said, what are local operators supposed to be? They're, you take a little n minus 1 sphere. So here we're taking a little circle, and we look at what are our states on a little circle. Well, okay, here we're doing gauge there, so we're looking at g connections on a little circle. What are connections on a little circle? Connections on a little circle are, are determined by the monogramy. So here's an attempt to draw a monogramy. So we have a connection on a little circle. The monogramy, what happens when we go all the way around the circle? That's an element of the group g. But in a non dealing group, it'll depend, the element you get will depend on where you started to measure. What you get will define is a conjugacy class of G. So uh, connections on the circle are given by conjugacy classes in my group G. So that means that local operators in the Eindel's theory are functions on conjugacy classes, which are exactly class functions. So we see the space of class functions appearing naturally. They're functions on connections on the circle. So that's the physics role, the physics origin of class functions. Well, we saw class functions before. Class functions were, came as the center of the group algebra. So let's see how does that appear. Well, we should think about these operators. We should think about how to multiply operators. Multiplication of operators is given by putting two disks together and thinking of them in a big disk. And you can kind of try to imagine if I have a monodromy G around this loop, a monodromy H around this loop, if I go look from the point of view of the big loop, I have monodromy G times H. When you spell out what this means on class functions, this tells you that the multiplication of local operators is the multiplication of class functions, <coughs> is the group algebra multiplication. So in other words, local operators in Young-Mills theory are exactly the center of the group algebra, which is this Bernstein center of the categories that we input in this boundary condition. Or if you like, it's exactly functions on the dual. So local operators are naturally functions on the dual, but they're also functions on the moduli space. That was the definition of the moduli space. In other words, the dual is the moduli space of the theory. This notion of, of dual is the notion of moduli space in, in um, moduli space of vacuum for this field theory. OK, now you might complain this is a whole lot of time to spend in order to, to think about the set of class functions on a finite or compact group. This is not, not really great justification. So uh, let's do a little propaganda going above two dimensions. So if you come to room L2 this week, uh, we're doing um, representation theory, and where these kind of themes have appeared in, in, in many of the talks, the, the world of 3D gauge theories and their moduli spaces, this is, ends up being exactly the modern setting, the modern spaces where geometric representation theory takes place. Um, so not in two dimensions where we get these little discrete things. In three dimensions, we get really interesting things. So for example, if you were in Sasha Brobman's talk on Monday, one of the great themes that you find in gauge theory, one of the great discoveries in gauge theory is called cyber wetting geometry. These moduli spaces in three-dimensional gauge theories have an extremely rich structure. They're hyperkähler spaces. They carry integrable systems. They have canonical quantizations. I won't explain any of the words, but they have. There's an extremely rich amount of geometry you can learn from the physics in this setting. Uh, if you come to Constantine Telemann's talk on Friday, you'll see a very powerful exploitation of, of symmetry in the setting of symplectic geometry, the setting of uh, categories from Witten theory, the A model. So we'll think about symplectic geometry with an action of a compact group. So these are two, two, two dimensional field theories with symmetries coming from a group. And you can get a tremendous understanding 
through, through this kind of point of view that we've been advocating. Uh, if you come to my talk tomorrow, you'll hear about some work with uh, Sam Gunning and David Nadler where we find new kind of commutative symmetries of following the kind of principles of this talk in problems in, in kind of classical representation here. But what I wanted to do was uh, conclude with what I think is maybe the most exciting um, realization of this principle, uh, this connection, which is in the geometric Hyman's program. Okay, so now we let's do the geometric Hyman's program in one slide. Um, so here we're going to start with a, a complex reductive group. So think of uh, GLNC, SLNC, and so on. And there we kind of have a, a table of analogies between the classical Langlands program and the geometric Langlands program. So before in Langlands program, we had a number field that helped us determine this arithmetical Euclid symmetric space. The number field gets replaced now by, by a Riemann surface. That's, that's our, our basic analogy. Uh, to a number field with uh, some data, we attach a locally symmetric space. Here, for Riemann surface, we're going to look at the space of, of holomorphic G bundles on this Riemann surface. We have a group G, we look at principal G bundles on C, and that's going to be a space we're going to study instead of a local symmetric space. Before, we had a Hilbert space with L2 functions on that locally symmetric space. <coughs> now we're going to look at some cohomology of this modulus response, maybe some orbital cohomology. Take this space and, and attach it to some cohomological impact. Okay. Um, before, we had HEC operators for associated each prime. The analog of a prime is going to be a point of my Riemann surface. So what are the heck operators? They were roughly something like modifying an elliptic curve using isogenies. The heck operators here are going to be take a bundle on a surface and modify it at a point. Instead of a prime, we're going to have a point. We're going to modify bundles at a point. So this is obviously extremely big. <coughs> Let's try to say a little bit more what a heck operator is in this setting. So there are going to be certain convolution operators. There are certain operators that are act now not in functions, but in cohomology classes or sheets or various things on the space plan G. So what are they going to be? They're going to take a, instead of a function, we have a cohomology class. We're going to take some kind of weighted average of it. That's what a heck operator is. Now, what is it going to be weighted average over? We're going to look over bundles that differ from a given bundle only at this single, single point. I fix a particular bundle, and I want to look at all bundles that differ from it only by modification of that point. That. So here's an attempt to draw that. Here I have a, a Riemann surface C. I have a particular point X. Now I have a bundle P. And what I'm going to study is bundles P prime. So here's another bundle of C. And it differs from X only at this, uh, differs from P only at this one point. In other words, identified away from this point. So how do you encode that? Maybe you can say, you can, since the bundles are identified away from this point, you can kind of glue them together to think of you know, this kind of, put a little air bubble in my Riemann surface. I guess people call it ravioli in this business uh, UFO. Um, but in any case, you blow a little air bubble and you think of a bundle on the surface where you kind of have twice the point x. They're not identified at x, but outside of x, they're the same. And if you think of this as a kind of correspondence, it gives you some kind of averaging operators. OK, so this is how heck operators are, are thought of in geometric Langlands. There's a beautiful physical picture of this introduced by Kapustin and Witten. Um, so they were working in the setting of the maximally supersymmetric gauge theories. And they said head operators are magnetic monopoles. What does that mean? We're going to uh, take a gauge theory. We're going to take our Riemann surface, and let's add some time variable. So here's a three ample Riemann surface cross time. And I'm going to insert a singularity into my gauge field at a particular point in time. So here's my point x. Here in the middle of time, I insert a singularity. I put in a magnetic monopole into this theory. So um, this is what's called an Etoff operator in the context of, of gauge theory. And this is, if, if you think of this picture, on one hand, it's the same picture we had on the previous slide kind of with some time interpolation. On the other hand, it's the same picture we have for, for operators in quantum field theory. We have a little blob in the middle where we insert something, and that gives an operator on states on this Riemann surface C. So that's kind of the physical way of thinking about hack operators, the magnetic monopoles. OK, great. So here's the kind of the punchline. Um, <laughs> HECA operators, we said already in the context of number theory, commute. If you look at these operators, these HECA modifications, um, they're in, also in geometric language, these operators all commute. Now, why do they commute? They also Drinkwell discovered a very deep, uh, a very deep understanding of the way why these operators commute. And the explanation really comes from by thinking about quantum field theory. They thought very hard about operators in quantum field theory. So what is the source of commutativity? Here it's a picture. It's going to be the same as the composition of operators we had before, but drawn kind of with a Riemann surface in mind. So here I have these two little blobs, these two modifications of a bundle. 
I try to compose them by doing one after the other, by stacking them. But then Balance and Grinfeld said, oh wait, we have a whole Riemann surface. We can kind of slide these blobs around. We can slide this orange blob off of the green blob, have it move around in a circle, and then slide it back under. Because we're in the world of topological, in the topological world, we are actually allowed to locally concentrate new things around. And so that gives us a way of going from A times B to B times A. In other words, Hecke operators commute because they're local operators in a quantum field theory. It's exactly the same picture that explained why operators commuted in, in the topological field theory. It's the same picture as explained why homotopy groups are commutative in dimensions bigger than two. It's the same commutativity in all these settings. So again, this is our third theme. This is where the commutativity comes because we have topology. We have room to move around. Well, since you have commutativity, again, we're, we know what to do. You're supposed to think of a spectrum. Someone gives you a commutative algebra, let's try to describe its spectrum, or physically we can call it the moduli space, representation theory we call it the dual, but in any case we're going to take the spectrum. The geometric Stefaki theorem is this duality. It tells us what this al commutative algebra is. <coughs> it, it's given by representations of some other group. It's called the Langlands dual group. So here's a couple of, of examples of Langlands duality. The, these heck operators form a commutative ring, which are these representations of the dual group. So that tells us how to calculate the spectrum. We then go out and calculate the spectrum of this, of this ring of Heck operators. That spectrum is now a space of flat G-dual bundles or local systems or representations of pi 1 into the dual group. So we get a spectrum, which is some space, this moduli space of the theory, is some space of connections for this Langlands dual group. So this is the geometric analog of the Galois representations in the Langlands program. Okay, so that's our, our duality. And <coughs> The duality appears in physics. If you ask the same question in the physics of electromagnetism, Kapustin wouldn't realize that this Langlands duality is electromagnetic duality in the world of physics. So this is a version of the fact that if you look at electromagnetism, you write down uh, Maxwell's equations in a vacuum, and you'll notice that the role of electricity and magnetism, the role of electricity and magnetic fields, are completely symmetric. There's, there's a non-abelian supersymmetric version of that called Montonian S duality. And that's exactly what geometric Langlands is doing. So here's our Fourier transform charge for the third time. We have a group, we have the G side and the G dual side. We have a kind of magnetic side and an electric side, or automorphic side and spectral side in the Langlands program point of view. So in the G side, we studied space of bundles on a Riemann surface. The spectrum uh, is something that appears in the dual side is some other space, this character variety for the dual group. But what was the role of this? On the G side, we have these interesting operators, these heck operators or these are Toft operators, or creation of monocle operators. The point of the duality is we've made them into something much simpler on the other side. We've made them into multiplication operators, or here are these called Wilson operators. They just correspond to taking your electromagnetic field and just measuring it along the loop, not doing any interesting insertions and modifications. So again, we've taken representation theory of G, this action of all these interesting heck operators, and made it into something much simpler, made it into geometry of the dual side. So this is, um, this is the, what the geometric Langlands program gives you, and at the, at the basic, the basic thing that you need to make it go is this is this commutativity. So this this uh, inside of Balance and Drinfeld, where commutativity comes from, has has taken on a, a life, several lives of its own. Um, they they took this idea of commutativity given by points moving around in space, an algebraic structure labeled by points colliding, and they encoded it. There's a notion of a factorization algebra. It's an algebra which is labeled by positions of points colliding. Uh, this gives rise to a very deep understanding of what a vertex algebra is, what are, what are the operators in conformal field theory. Give rise to an understanding of what operators in topological field theory are, and more generally, work of Custal and William, a point of view of how do you think about operators in, in any quantum field theory. The same pictures appear very quickly in, in, uh, in for example, in many places. For example, if you, we talk about the places where you had level structure number theory, there are places where there's ramification. You can do this in, in geometry, too. Physically, it corresponds to adding a solenoid, so it's an extended object here. So here's a picture where we have a heck operator. The green operator is kind of pinned to the singularity. We have a point on the Riemann surface where something special is happening, where there's singularity. But this orange operator is not pinned to it. It's, it's, a, it's a heck operator coming from the unramified point. So it can slide off, move all the way around, and slide back on. So this is a uh, you know, one-line version of gates squares beautiful understanding of, of the center of ramified Hecke algebras. You can find centers of Hecke algebras, even when they're non-commutative, even when they're happening at a rotation point, from the
the geometry of coins sliding around. Uh, and to my mind, the most exciting thing recently is um, this ideas of, of factorization, this idea of collision of points, have made it all the way from physics to number theory. So in the work of Peter Schultz, the, this idea of factorization of points moving around is sort of magically taken, been taken into the world of number theory and it gives a geometric explanation of the community of classical heck operators. So you can, oh, so you can imagine here, this is somehow some horrible caricature of what he's doing, is like we, we think of a picture of, of the integers, spectrum of the integers, and here's uh, point P, and we're going to think very, very close to P, and in Schultz's world, we can have the modifications. Instead of having them sit right at the point P, they can allow it to move around a little bit as near, near the point P on, in spec of ZP, have these two points move around and then collide back again. And so it's the same picture of commutativity as in, um, as in Valence and Drinfeld. And I would recommend coming to Laurent Fart's uh, talk on Friday. And Fart, as conjecture, but is part of these kinds of ideas, gives us a completely radically new understanding of what the classical Einmann's program, local Einmann's program is about, exactly with these kind of pictures as a kind of geometric Einmann's. So where next? There's a whole lot of more space. Um, these theories actually go to 11. But uh, we can, in particular in six dimensions, there's a topic of great interest to a lot of us, which we call theory X. It's some six-dimensional theory, which where all of these phenomena, like electromagnetic duality, subject wind theory, and so on, are all encoded in a purely geometric way. And there's, there's a whole lot more where these ideas are expected to take us. 